It's not about finding the pitch. It's about relaxing into the pitch and a beautifully in tune environment. It's not about finding the pitch. It's about relaxing into the pitch and a beautifully in tune environment. Now, some of you may already completely understand that and be on the same page with me. Some of you may be thinking, huh, what? How does that even work? Or you may be somewhere in between. Again, I really want questions today. I want a lot of back and forth today, but I'll, I'll chat for a little bit before we get that started. I have a little anecdote that I tell often, um, and my student um, from a few years ago, Lesdy, knows I tell this story because I, I was so impressed and in awe and just inspired and it's, it's helped so many people just by telling the story. So Lesdy, uh, when she was studying with me at UTA, very talented, very, very talented flutist, one of those naturals, you know, where it just wasn't hard for her to get her fingers moving fast. And she wasn't necessarily the best practicer, but you know, she could, she could play the scales and she could play impressive stuff without it being too stressful. We had to dig in a lot on her rhythm to get it really honest, um, but it was, you know, she almost always sounded very nice. Well, her tuning was problematic. Her sound was pretty enough that it wasn't an issue of like, oh, she sounds awful or, you know, uh, it wasn't an emergency situation, but she was a music education major with the talent and potential to really reach a high level of flute playing. So tuning was on the table and, and it was kind of disappointing to both of us when she was so passionate, but her high notes would be sharp and her low notes would be flat and her um, middle register notes in what I call the danger zone, like uh, B natural in the staff up through D sharp slash E, that they would be kind of wild and all over the place and often extremely sharp around the C sharp. And so, you know, she wanted it to sound better because she had good ears. I wanted it to sound better. And we did the usual, which was a lot of my piano exercises, a lot of sing it, play it, sing it, play it. I use the tuner as a reference for awareness, but I don't get glued to the visual of the tuner like that um, example I mentioned of a conductor or a teacher putting it in the flutist's face, or even worse yet, those pickups. If you love those pickups, apologies, but you know those um, wire connectors to the tuner? Ooh, I just find those so problematic. Um, so, you know, we did all the normal things, and again, she didn't sound bad. She sounded pretty but not the level she was capable of. And the constant theme was busy brain. The constant theme was busy brain. And let me tell you a few of her symptoms of busy brain when it came to tuning. And I will say this tends to be across the board. It wasn't just Lesdy. One, she had a lot of information in her head from advice, very well-meaning advice that she had collected over the years about, oh, this note tends to be sharp, so you need to bring it down. This note tends to be flat, so you need to bring it up. I will tell you in a second why I actually find that extremely problematic, um, but that was one of her major issues. Number two, she was often so worried about the tuning itself, and I probably contributed to that because I would say things like, oh, we really wanna get that E in the sweet spot or that's not in tune, and then I added to the busy brain. But she was often so concerned with the tuning that she lost sight of what was important, the long line, the sing-along surrender, the flow in the music. And hopefully you guys are on the same page with me and or have picked it up over the course of this course that I really believe momentum and flow are everything. And when you suck momentum and flow out of the equation, we're not really dealing with music. So even if you fix the pitch, it's not transferable and it's not sustainable. So one, busy brain trying to fix every note. Two, so obsessed with fixing every note that she was losing sight of the big picture, which is momentum, flow, and singing. Worse yet, number three, her confidence was so low 
because of how often she would hear herself play out of tune. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Sometimes the students that play the most out of, the, out of tune, they're caught in a vicious cycle and they're the most sensitive to it, but it's the fact that they're getting so repeatedly stressed out that's perpetuating the problem. So those were the three main issues. And let me tell you about the day that it all changed for Leslie. And then I'll tell you how come I think it solved all three of those issues. So she was playing Deep Blue by Ian Clark. And for those of you that have played it or listened to it, you know that piece is not going to be nearly as beautiful or effective if it's out of tune. Even if it's out of tune a little bit, the magical spell is, is broken. So the tuning was essential. She knew it. Um, she and I had discussed it. We had brainstormed. She was in the piano rehearsal. And it was a really beautiful moment that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. I saw her put her flute down. The pianist and I were just kind of waiting to see what was going on with her. But I saw her put her flute down and breathe. <sighs> she picked up her flute and proceeded to play more in tune than I had ever heard her play. And not only that, she stayed that way for the rest of that rehearsal. And she stayed that way for the rest of the time that she was my student and I got to hear her play in lessons. I literally was present for the moment when she crossed over. And we talked about it many times after that. And as I mentioned, I've told this story many times because it just is such an impression, um, it left such an impression on me. When I asked her what she did after the rehearsal was over, you know, and after much enthusiastic praise, because it was so beautiful, I had goosebumps, I was tearing up. I mean, you know that piece, and especially if a student that has sounded pretty, but then all of a sudden they sound like transcendently beautiful. As flute teachers, you guys know the emotions that come along with a moment like that. When I asked her what she did, she said, you know, I was so sick of it not working I finally did what you've been saying this whole time. I quit thinking about anything else and I just listened. And it was, that was it. <laughs> that was it. She didn't have a big essay on how she fixed the C sharp and brought the air down and did her embouchure this way and held her flute this way and remembered what this band director said and remember, no. For the first time in a real live performance situation, she stopped the busy brain and she went into what I call sing-along surrender. So let's go back through those three issues that she had. One of the reasons I think fixing a note, like, oh, this C sharp tends to be so sharp, bring it down. This high F sharp tends to be so high, bring it down. This low E natural tends to be so low, bring it up. The reason I find that so problematic is because anytime you're bringing it up or lowering it down, you're guessing. You're guessing. You might be going in the right direction, but there's an element of randomness to it that's still hit or miss. I want to go back to something that I think I've already mentioned in this course, but it's such a big part of my thinking as a player and a teacher, it bears repeating. Every sweet spot on the flute is contained in that back wall, that tiny, tiny back wall on the tone hole. Every note from a low B up to the highest note you can play is in this big of a space. And I love that um, statement that the genie said uh, in that original Aladdin when Robin Williams was the genie. Unlimited cosmic powers, itty bitty living space. You know, that's the flute. Unlimited cosmic powers, itty bitty space where all the sweet spots are. The second a student thinks, oh, I need to bring it down, they've already overshot. They've already gone 
too far. Now that's assuming they have the body mapping awareness to even bring it down. And that's another issue that we can talk about is air angle. But when that is their main criteria, they're not gonna find the sweet spot that they're looking for. And then when you combine that with, okay, I'm sort of randomly guessing and I know I'm supposed to bring it down and hopefully I even know what that means. And I'm gonna use the visual of the tuner to confirm whether I'm bringing it down or not. Maybe I need that smiley face on tonal energy or I need to see the needle in the middle. Well, is that piece in C sharp minor? Is that piece in D flat major? If so, okay, great, because the tonic, you know, we hope that it is in the middle. But every other pitch has a different place it needs to be, not the middle right? It needs to be in context. So this is why I added the last part of that box about tuning. It's not just about relaxing into the pitch. It's about relaxing into a beautifully in tune environment. When the student is listening in the world of sound, in the key of C sharp minor, in the key of D flat major, or whatever key they're in, or um, you know the way Leslie was listening to the piano part in deep blue, she wasn't thinking to herself, bring this note up, bring this note down, bring this note up, bring this note down. She was placing the pitches where they went based on the harmonies in the piano part. And that is just everything. Those of you that completely understand what I'm saying, I hope you feel as passionately about it as I do. Those of you that are kind of curious and are like, huh, haven't thought about that before, I hope that you continue to think about it because it's kind of a big deal. And I want to be clear, I'm not bashing tuners and I'm not bashing directors or teachers that use tuners. I just think it's a small part of the picture and it's a tool like any other that needs to be used in context. And often it needs to be an accessory to much more practice of listening in the key, in the harmony. So number one hopefully makes sense that fixing a pitch often creates more problems than it solves. Not saying don't know about tendencies, that's, that's helpful, but, but don't make that the main hook. Number two, Keep in mind, and this is for you, the teacher, because if you don't keep it in mind, how can your students keep it in mind? Keep in mind that long lines, momentum and flow, playing through your flute like you're singing is the whole point. So if you get one note in tune, like dun -da -da -da, my C sharp was in tune, but everything else around it didn't make musical sense, has there really been a goal accomplished? So being in that sing-along surrender, which in case I haven't explained this well enough, I'll just have an aside here. I usually start the first time I mention sing-along surrender to students, I say, okay, let's sing Mary Had a Little Lamb together. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb. We just go through it. And then I, I point out, wouldn't it be strange if you were analyzing every syllable you sang? Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. You know, who, nobody sings like that. And, and the tuning would get really wild really fast if they did. Um, so that's the simple example of sing-along. And sing-along surrender to me, the epitome of it is like driving along Highway 1 in California with the top of your convertible down and your stereo blasting with your favorite music and you're singing at the top of your lungs or like singing in the shower when nobody's around to hear you. Sing along, surrender. That's the goal. So if a note is in tune but it's in isolation, in a vacuum, I don't even know if that was really worth doing because I'd almost rather hear the flutist play with sing-along surrender and have some tuning issues than to be so awkwardly in tune and not have any momentum and flow or passion in their music. You know that quote from Beethoven, right? To play a, a wrong note is, is human, to err is human, but to play a note without passion is inexcusable. You know, I, I'd rather hear the passion with a little bit of tuning problems than to suck the passion out of the equation just for the sake of that one note making the needle on the tuner stop in the middle. And then the third thing, Leslie's confidence was so low. 
there is nothing like playing a note out of tune and knowing that you're out of tune and trying to play in tune but but not being able to get there there's nothing like that to just uh, kind of kill your flute self-esteem and it might just be for a moment but if those moments keep repeating especially in a piece that obviously she loved she selected it herself she wanted to play something so beautiful you know it hurts even more if it was just like an A2 that she was playing that was assigned to her, that would be one thing. But this was a piece that she really wanted to sound amazing on, so it was kind of killing her that it wasn't sounding amazing. So when she stopped and she listened, and I do think that the training we had invested together and she had invested in her own practice sessions, that kicked in when she decided to stop and listen. It wasn't coming just from nothing, right? Um, but when she decided to stop and listen, and let go of the addiction of busy brain, because it is an addiction, we're all addicted to it. When she decided to let go, all the problems were solved instantly. She was transported. There was no need to fix anything because she was playing an E minor in tune. There was no need to play awkwardly or like a robot because the listening was the way that she was now participating in momentum flow and sing-along surrender. And then the second she started sounding so beautiful and so lovely in tune, blending with what the piano sounded like, oh my gosh, her self-esteem skyrocketed. And it didn't have to do with stickers I gave her or compliments I gave her. It came from inside of her that knowing that this sounded amazing. So. Having said all of that, I want to show you the coaching that I do in lieu of just sticking a tuner in my students' faces, which again, not bashing tuners, just keep it in context, keep it as a tool, not the main event.